Hello, my name is Kim Eagle from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm the editor of ACC.org. And I'm delighted to have with me today Deepak Bhatt from uh, Boston, Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, it's November 14th, Saturday at the American Heart Association meeting, 2020 virtual annual scientific sessions. There's a couple of uh, trials today that we thought we would like to share with our audience. Yeah, don't you love cardiologists? They come up with these amazing acronyms for trials. It's one of the most creative things we do. Uh, and today is no exception. We have Alpheus and River, two great names, important trials. Uh, Deepak, start us off with the Alpheus trial. Yes, this is an interesting study looking at ticagrelor versus clopidogrel in elective PCI, about 1,900 patients randomized to one of those two treatment strategies and really looking at periprocedural complications, periprocedural MI, stent thrombosis, bleeding, and so forth. The bottom line from this study is there was no significant difference in terms of efficacy between those two strategies. So despite more potent platelet inhibition with ticagrelor in this particular setting, no advantage over clopidogrel, although there was more minor bleeding, significantly more minor bleeding. So overall, a message that for the average elective PCI patient, it seems like clopidogrel does the trick. Tell me about the, th there was a sub-study here looking at platelet inhibition. And it raised the question that ticagrelor was superior. And this seems like a theme over and over and over. I see these antiplatelet agents compared to one another's differences in apparent platelet inhibition. And yet the translation of that science to human outcomes seems to be lost in translation. Yeah, this is a really great point that you're bringing up. It's a disconnect that's hard to totally explain, to be honest. There's for sure more platelet inhibition with ticagrel versus clopidogrel. Numerous prior studies have shown that. There's this based on mechanism action, so forth. there's no question it's more potent as an antiplatelet. And in this study, it, it's also demonstrated by the fact there's more minor bleeding. So for sure, there's more antiplatelet effect. There's also a bit more dyspnea, a known side effect of ticagrel versus clopidogrel. But what you're pointing to is there was significant more platelet inhibition. There's a bit more minor bleeding, why isn't there more efficacy? If there's no more efficacy, is there any value in measuring platelet function? Of course, they did it here for scientific purposes, but there are a few people out there that are measuring platelet function to titrate therapy or, or de-escalate and so forth, but uh, it's just not consistent between studies, the connection between degree of platelet inhibition and cardiovascular outcomes. It's probably because there's so many other inputs, so many other factors that go into it. And I also think there's been some shifts. You know, these are patients who are troponin negative or, you know, they were troponin positive, very low levels. So a pretty elective, low risk population in that regard. Though there were some complex patients and low, there was some bifurcation and even left main stenting in there. Uh, though, you know, it's still conceivable that if it were a 1900 patient study of unprotected left main specifically, you know, maybe there, there might have been some sort of benefit, but it, it's all really complex relationships because sometimes you might think left main, you know, the stakes are really high, get really potent agents on board. That makes sense. But on the other hand, it's a large diameter. So it's actually less likely to have stent thrombosis, though if it occurred, it could be more catastrophic. So, you know, I, I think the bottom line is the data are what they are for, for patients, including some with complex procedures in a modest sample size, no obvious benefit of moving beyond clopidogrel for elective PCI. Yeah, the, the platelet inhibition studies remind me a little bit of the genetic studies of the predisposition to clotting uh, with the antiplatelet drugs. And once again, I think you're right on here that the uh, a coronary event is such a complex phenomenon that, that thinking that a single parameter like that is going to carry a large day in terms of a very complex physiology is just not logical. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the clopidogrel genetic story I thought was really scientifically interesting, but it hasn't proved to be actionable. That is, there's so many other factors if someone smokes or not, you know, their body mass index, all sorts of things that can affect the variability of clopidogrel response. The genetics certainly can, but it's overall not 
an enormous piece of the modifiable pi, it seems, and, and platelet function even less so than genetics, at least in genetics, you know, if you're a homozygote for uh, reduced function alleles for clopidogrel metabolism, you know, that's probably not a great thing to be on clopidogrel if you're in that situation. But fortunately, that's a relatively small percentage of people. So overall, you know, I would say here for elective PCI, as most folks are doing, clopidogrel seems to be fine. But there are people out there that are, if they're doing really complex bifurcation stenting, you know, long areas of stenting and so forth, do like to use prasugrel or ticagrelor, but at least this study and a previous study with prasugrel as well in this situation, these authors did a, a forward analysis of those two, don't support that strategy. Right. All right. Any trial that is named related to fly fishing, I'm in a love, right? <laughs> And so today's trial called River uh, lit me up. Um, and it, it's a great trial because we know that mechanical mitral valve disease and AFib, those patients need warfarin. The, the novel anticoagulants or the direct acting, depending on how you want to call them, do not seem to, to work in that group. Contrarywise, now the non-valvular AFib, we routinely tend to use the novel agents, the direct acting agents, and, and warfarin is really relegated to a second here. And this study, River, looked at the group that had a tissue, a tissue mitral valve and a fib, sort of in between. Uh, and this is actually an important group of patients that I treat. Uh, they randomized about a thousand patients to either rivaroxaban or warfarin at traditional doses, followed them for a year, and ask the question, did the rivaroxaban group have fewer cardiovascular events and what about bleeding? And I was delighted to see the outcomes. It looked like rivaroxaban had a significant reduction in the combined endpoint, also certainly trends in the benefit for stroke and did not have more bleeding, if anything, a tendency for less bleeding. This trial for me, Deepak, is practice changing or certainly convincing me that what I thought was true is true. What did you think of it? I agree with you entirely. I thought it was a home run. It is clearly practice changing, although I was already doing it. But, but I think that you know, many people understandably felt that no acts were for non-valvular atrial fibrillation. And if you have a bioprosthetic mitral valve, is that valvular or, or not? So it was, as you said, that kind of gray zone even though there have been some patients like this studied and included in the pivotal randomized clinical trials of NOAC, the overall number of those sorts of patients was relatively low with bioprosthetic valves. So to me, this is great evidence that even in the presence of a bioprosthetic valve, then a NOAC is the way to go. Of course, it should be a full dose appropriate per the label uh, dosing of the NOAC that is used. Sometimes people underdose NOACs. You definitely wouldn't want to do that in general, but you wouldn't want to do it here. But uh, with that one caveat, I think that's the way to go. The other caveat, not pertaining to the trial, but the population study is, of course, these trials are for the population that was actually enrolled. So if a patient has a mechanical valve, uh, regardless of the position, warfarin uh, at a uh, therapeutic range for that particular valve remains strongly indicated. The data to date for NOACs, there's some ongoing trials, but the data to date does not support use of NOACs with or without atrial fibrillation if a, if a mechanical a valve is present. Again, mitral aortic doesn't matter the position. Their warfarin still is the winner. Yeah, I was like you because some of these patients with bioprosthetic valves made it into the warfarin versus NOAC studies. I was trending in this direction, but this trial I think solidifies our knowledge to say, yeah, that's, that is the right strategy. It's effective and it's safe and we should be doing it reliably for our patients with this unique circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even though you said you were doing it and I said I was doing it, that doesn't mean it was necessarily the right thing to do. We, we could have been incorrect. I mean, you know, sort of like uh, what we were discussing before with Ticago, there are folks that are doing it in elective PCI, and it might be the right thing to do in select cases, of course, but, but you know, it, it's really a matter of following evidence-based medicine. And here, uh, this river trial provides us with evidence-based medicine that we really should shift our practice with respect to using no acts in bioprosthetic valves. Well, with yeah, it's, just, uh, it's just so healthy to have reliable science to solidify our foundations. And this is a, a great trial that um, Delighted was completed 
uh, and we were able to report to our audience today. Yeah, absolutely. So two big trials today, Altheus and River, that we uh, really enjoyed, wanted to share with you. I hope you're safe. Uh, this is Kim Eagle for ACC.org from the National Scientific Sessions of the American Heart Association.